the tie-dyed color elephant in the room. Um, if you haven't noticed, we've got a lot of kiddos wearing these shirts that are painted. Uh, That's because we sent 25 kids up to Idlewild this past week for SoCal Teen Camp. Um, it's a camp we go to every year. It's a camp that I'm excited to be a part of, that I'm glad our kids are a part of, because it changes lives. Um, it, it, this week was spent focusing on hearing the word of God, hearing God's calling. And so our theme, Echoes, is on the front of our shirt, seeing God's echoes, hearing his echoes, um, even when we can't hear his voice. Um, so uh, ask the kids that are wearing these shirts about how they heard God's voice. Um, and especially if you get a chance, talk to Andrew Day. Andrew, stand up. Andrew. Andrew heard God's voice this week, and, and he decided to commit his life to Christ. He was baptized, um, and I'm just so impressed by the way he has matured, the way he has grown uh, spiritually as, as well as physically, if, if he, yeah, but, yeah, give me, so, talk to these kids, talk to Andrew, come talk to me if you have any questions about camp or, or King's Camp, which is coming up next week, so. Uh, it's just an exciting time, and I'm, I'm so glad that we are a part of it. Thank you. Go away for a couple weeks, and you forget everything. You forget how to turn your microphone on. Several years ago, a couple of guys did a study at Abilene Christian University about the spiritual development and growth of of young people, and after all their research, they came out and they said that number two, outside of parents, the number one outside of parents, the key moments that help teens to grow spiritually was camp, was summer camp, devoting a week of having fun together, but studying God's word and meeting with him and listening to his voice. They said camp was the number two spiritual influencer in the lives of young people growing up in the Lord. And so we're so glad you guys got to go and we're anxious to hear about it. I directed the camp for many years and it was always hard. It's a, it was an exhausting thing. And yet it was one of those things that would build you up. It left you at the end of the week going, God was here. We're exhausted. We can't hardly take another step, but we've been in the presence of God, and it is a marvelous, marvelous thing. We're so grateful for parents who send their kids up. We're so grateful for parents who bring their kids. We're grateful for kids. And we're grateful for our teachers who help teach our children, and they don't get enough praise. That's hard work, and it's important work. We just got back from a trip. We got to spend some time with our grandkids. My granddaughter is four years old. She'll tell you I'm four and a half. <clears throat> but at four years old, she has memorized. I can't tell you how many songs from how many movies. She knows word for word. She knows the scripts. She knows the characters. Like she knows their accents. Like she knows their personalities. She can feed them back to you. And then people tell me, they're just kids. That, you know, wait till they get older, then we'll teach them. <laughs> These children at two, three, four years old are soaking up all kinds of information that build a foundation for who they are. They learn it at a very early age. And our teachers who are helping their parents to instill within our children these godly Christian knowledge and values are priceless. Teachers, thank you for investing yourselves into our children. Um, <clears throat> and as Michael said, we're asking our teachers one more thing. To, to meet your children today and, and each Sunday, to meet your children at the Bible Hour room at 1010 to escort them to their classes. So we're going to dismiss our teachers early, although I may still be preaching at 1010. 
So when you see the clock hit 1010, you can get up and go, and we won't think a thing bad about you, but only the teachers, nobody else. Understand? Got it. Just the teachers. And then also to help our teachers out and to help our children out, parents, if you have children in the classes, we'd like for you to meet your children at 1115 and pick them up from your class. Um, please don't send other people just to keep your children safe. Make sure we know who we're handing them off to. Parents, would you please pick your kids up at 1115 and let our teachers close up their rooms. We just got back from vacation, and vacation is great. Don't you love vacation? Well, there we go. There we go. I got to, I got to spend some time with my son and his family, Brooke and the grand girls, and it was a marvelous time to, to be with them, meet them in Texas, and then come up to Colorado, and my son and I got to backpack back into the Rocky Mountains and camp out in the wilderness next to this lake, just below the Continental Divide. It's just, God is good, you know? The things that he made are just amazing. And we both, at <laughs> multiple times, just stood in awe at the mighty power of God and the wisdom and the creativity and the beauty of God. And it was a wonderful time to, to feast together. And also, in, in i got to tell you, once we got out of California, another thing I really appreciated. <laughs> now, I don't want to see any mass exodus in California, but... Don't fill up till you cross the border. <laughs> God is good to us. He has taught us many good things. But you know what? Sometimes I've been around enough to know that when I think I'm saying something very clear, and I understand perfectly what I'm saying, and I assume that the person I'm talking to understands completely what I'm saying, I know that doesn't always happen. I know that sometimes people hear something different than what I actually mean to say. And so we sometimes get confused. I tell people that communication is easy. We communicate all the time. The thing that's hard about communication is clarity. Because we don't always communicate what we think we are, and we don't always hear what a person actually says or actually means. And so it's not always easy to be clear in our communication. And it's a little bit like the announcement that was made after uh, during church once that there would be a meeting of the board after services in room 105. And so after services in room 105 walked a first time guest. The board members looked around and said, can we help you? He said, well, I'm here for a meeting of the board. He said, well, it's only board members. He said, <laughs> After that sermon, there's nobody more bored than I am, so I'm here. Sometimes we say things and people hear a different message. And in Christianity, in the Christian culture, we often put together biblical ideas with human wishes. We often combine things into cliches that are not always what the Bible says. And so we've been looking at some things that the Bible does not say, just so we have some clarity in the, in the communication that God is doing to us. In the Christian culture, we put together these cliches, but they're, they're often built on something that is true. There's a, a sound of truth to it, so it sounds good. It is true that God wants to help us bear our burdens, even if the Bible doesn't say that he won't give us more than we can handle. It is true that God works good for, in, for all things. For he works for good in all things. Even if it doesn't say that everything happens for a reason. A couple of weeks ago, 
talked about God having a specific plan for our life that the Bible doesn't say he does. And I was challenged on that. I said, wait a minute, God does have a specific plan. But the Bible doesn't say that. And if, as we look into the lives of people in the Bible, we see that that doesn't happen, that, that God may have a plan. But instead of having a blueprint for his, our lives, where if we make a mistake, we don't make something just according to the blueprint, the whole building falls down, God has more of a game plan. So that as the other team makes different choices, as our players rise and fall, the game plan can change and deal with all the movements of the game. God is not a one plan only. He's got plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, to infinity. He can deal with all the different things that happen in our lives. Sometimes people have come to me and said, God, Doug, I made a mistake. I married the wrong person. I said, well, maybe you did. Maybe God had somebody out there for you and you didn't wait. Maybe you pushed the envelope too hard. Maybe you were too hungry for something. Maybe you were trying to fill a need in your life that you didn't let God fill. Maybe, maybe you did make a mistake, but guess what? It's no longer a mistake. Well, God had a plan. God wanted me to marry that person. That's who I want to marry now. But, said, but you're already married. This now is God's plan for your life. His plan for your life is to follow him wherever you're at. Did I make a mistake a long time ago? I made plenty of them. Does that negate God's plan for my life? No. God has multiple plans for my life. God does guide us. God does open doors for us. And he says, you choose. Will you walk through the one I open for you or will you choose your own? And I can make mistakes and God can deal with that. Isn't that good news? Because have any of you made mistakes? <laughs> Nobody raised their hand because, except for Grace. Except because we know, of course, we all have made mistakes. Thank God. He doesn't have just one plan for our lives. He works with all kinds of things. But we say things out of good intentions. We want to do the things that honor God. We say things that can encourage people. We want to be good for people. But sometimes our good intentions end up actually hurting the name of God. There is one thing our culture is obsessed with. And I'm, I've got to be very careful this morning because this obsession has infiltrated the church. And people don't like you messing with this idea. And it's the idea that God wants me to be happy. Our culture is obsessed with happiness. And you don't want to mess with somebody's idea and their efforts to be happy. In fact, that is probably one of the chief things. If you keep me from pursuing my idea of happiness, then you are evil. Our culture is saying that to us today. Whatever fills me, whatever completes me, whatever why my heart longs for, I should be able to pursue and to have, right? After all, it's a fundamental part of our Constitution. We have the right to pursue happiness, right? Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so don't mess with it, right? Right. You're afraid to say it right because you know I'm going to say something else, don't you? Yeah, I'm going to set you up for that. Here's the deal. We sometimes happy, but we also worship God. And so it's inevitable that, that we might combine those two things and say, you know, God wants me to be happy. God loves his children. And don't parents who love their children want their children to be happy? Doesn't it follow that God 
would want his children to be happy. And so we run a danger of thinking it's God's job to make me happy. Sometimes it says more about us and our wants than it says about who God is. We begin to think that it's God's business to make sure that we're happy and that it sounds true that God should want his children to be happy because, after all, he doesn't want us to be unhappy, does he? A loving God? I want those children to suffer. No. That doesn't follow the picture of a loving God. And yet, is there suffering in the world? Absolutely. Is there suffering among Christians? All the time. Did Jesus say we're going to have trouble in this world? He promised it. But we don't like that verse. We want the one about happiness. The Bible doesn't say that happiness is a problem. But the Bible does not teach that we should be gloomy Christians either. It doesn't teach that we should go around with long faces. Sometimes Christians seem too serious about life to have fun. Too serious about life to let down and enjoy people. And sometimes Christians are, are looked at as people who are too critical. And they're pointing the finger. And they're picking out the problems. And they're complaining about the government, about Hollywood, and about the movies, about, it, about the people. And about, they're complaining about all the problems instead of enjoying the good things that God has given us. And sometimes Christians have given God a bad name. The Bible doesn't tell us we need to be grouchy Christians. But neither does it promise us that things will be a bed of roses. And so we need to be careful that we represent God well. He wants his children to enjoy his creation. But he wants us to trust on him during the hard times. We think... We were, well, I know, we were created in God's image. But here's something about God that's important for us to know. I think God has fun. I think God, have you ever looked at his creation? Have you ever looked at animals that he made and just laughed? Do you think God had fun when he was making animals? He made a horse, this beautiful, magnificent creature. He made the giraffe, too. What was he thinking with a giraffe? Who would have thought, stretch that neck out so long, but they are graceful, they're beautiful animals. But then he made the hippopotamus. <laughs> You're on a good theme there, God. Horse, giraffe, hippopotamus. <laughs> have you ever looked at the fish that swim in the ocean? Some of them are gorgeous, aren't they? Some of them are the most ugly creatures I've ever seen in my life. And they're bizarre. What was God thinking? How did he come up with all those things? I think God sat up there and said, <laughs> let's try this one out. Yeah, that'll, that'll fool them. I think God had fun with his creation. And he made some marvelous things. And God, as a good father, loves it when his children delight in the good things that he has done. It was so good as Brian and I were backpacking through the wilderness there in the Rockies that we would stop and he would just start laughing. He just started laughing. He said, <laughs> you see, he lives in Lubbock, Texas. So <laughs> as he looked around at God's creation, he said, this is unreal. This is just unbelievable that God would make this. And he just laughed with the joy of being in God's creation. And it was refreshing. And I think God laughed with him. And God smiled. Because my children are enjoying what I've given to them. God likes when we're happy. We were meeting with my, my family in Colorado with a, all the cousins getting together. And it was a blessing to hear the children laughing and playing together. And having a good time, my brother has chickens in a tree house. And they're taking the chickens in the tree house. And, and it, they're having a good time. And it was fun. And I think God rejoices 
when he sees us rejoice in what he has made for us. But it is not God's job to keep us happy all the time. In fact, as a good parent, you know that it's not your job to ensure that your children are happy all the time, right? Right? If you did everything that your children wanted to be happy, how would they grow up? If you provided everything they wanted, they would grow up to be spoiled, petty. They would grow up to be immature, self-absorbed adults who don't know how to deal with the world. There is hurt and there's hardship and there are difficult things in this life. And God says, I put you here to deal with these things. I won't do it. I was about to go off on a tangent. I'm going to stay the course. I'm not going to say anything about bullying. However, <laughs> sometimes we want to make sure that everybody's happy and nobody ever gets hurt. But there are bullies in this world, and there will always be bullies in this world. And it's better to learn how to deal with the bullies than try to take them out. But sometimes we want to protect our children. And sometimes when we get bullied, we get angry. God, where are you? Why don't you take care of me? Why don't you make me happy? And that is not God's job. He says, I will be with you through the hard times. I will walk with you and I will help you grow. And James says in his letter, he says, count it pure joy when you do what? And you counter various trials and hardships. He said, I'm not going to take those away because those things help you grow. If you embrace them, if you face them, if you deal with them. But if you try to hide them and take them all away, we grow up soft, self-absorbed, spoiled. We don't want to be that kind of people. We see here, <coughs> Ecclesiastes, Solomon said this. He said, understand that when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Put the brakes on. Whoa, what? Who makes bad things? That was brave. Satan makes bad things, right? What does the Bible say? Let's see what the Bible says. God has made the one as well as the other. Does God send us hard things? Sometimes he does. Sometimes he allows hard things. Sometimes God says, I need you to grow beyond where you're at. I've heard kids say, I am tired of living at home. I'm tired of dealing with my parents' rules. They're always putting things on me. They're always saying what I can't do and what I can't do. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move out. I'm going to join the Marines. I'm going to the military. I'll show them. <laughs> you ever heard about jumping from the frying pan into the fire? Sometimes hard things make us to be the people God needs us to be. And so we embrace the hard times and we hold on to God to get us through those things. Instead of saying, take away all the hardship, I want to be happy. Happiness comes in learning how to deal with the hardships. There are hardships that everybody faces. And sitting right here in this room, there are people who are in times of rejoicing and delight. And there are people who are in hard times and times of mourning this morning here. And a church should be big enough to deal with both. To rejoice with those who rejoice. To mourn with those who mourn. To surround those who need their help. To, to lift up those people who have been blessed with something good. It is not something we need to avoid, but rather embrace the good and the bad. When times are good, laugh. 
be happy. When times are hard, remember, God is the author of both. Never, God never commanded that we should be happy all the time. He didn't say, if you're sad, there's a problem. He didn't command us. He did say there is a time to mourn. He did say there is a time to laugh. Embrace both of them and let them rule your life. And James, try to bring that up. James says this. He says, if any, is any among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Pray to God in the hard times. Don't complain to God in the hard times. James says God is using those hard times to make you something you could never be otherwise. So rejoice in it. You don't have to put on a, a plastic face, though, and pretend it doesn't hurt. We can be real. We can say this is horrible. We struggle through hard times. And James says pray about it. Seek God's strength to grow through it. Sometimes we ask the question, why, God? Why did you let this happen? Why? And the question should rather be, what, God? What do you want me to learn through this? What do you want me to be through this? How do you want me to change? Instead of blaming God for doing something that takes away your happiness. So we choose to follow God. God never claimed that happiness was his highest goal for our life. What he claimed was that our presence with him, our union with him is his goal. What he actually said is that the glory of his name is the highest goal. And by uniting us with him, his name is glorified. And we get to be the recipients of his glory. That is good news. But there's a lot of misery. Misery. It ensues from the idea that I'm entitled to be happy. There are people who might say, if God wants me to be happy, if God wants me to be happy, <clears throat> then I've come to this decision that whatever makes me happy is what is right. If this makes me happy, then that's what God wants for me, right? If I believe that God's business is to keep me happy, and I believe that happiness is so important, and you might say, you know, I've got all this debt that's crushing my life. But you know, those shoes would fit with this outfit perfectly, and if I just put a little bit on the credit card again, it won't hurt, and we become slaves to our debtors. Because there's something that will make me happy. Or you might look across the street. There's a lot of crazy things going on at that party. Man, I don't know about that party, but it sure looks like they're having a good time. And I could use a little happiness in my life right now. And God wants me to be happy, right? And we venture into places we shouldn't go. We get into some things that are sometimes pretty crazy. And I've actually heard this too many times. When a man or a woman comes to me and says, Doug, I know I've made some promises. I've made some vows. I've, I've said some things about till death do us part. But, but you don't know what I'm going through. I'm just not happy. And by the way, I've met someone who does make me happy. And we think that the happiness is what God has called us to. But what God has called us to is faithfulness, trusting, following, obedience so that his name is glorified and he is glorified and we are recipients of his grace and mercy and you're united with him and when we are united with him we experience something that all the the parties and the shoes and the the people can never provide for us God gives us his spirit that wells up inside of us to create a living fountain that can't be put out it is life 
abundant. John 10.10 10 says that the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan is the one. His only desire is to deceive you, to trick you, to change your mind, to think a lie, to believe a lie. Jesus says, but I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. He did not say, I've come to make you happy. He said, I've come to give you real life. Life that deals with the ups and the downs, with the mourning, with the laughing, with the crying, with the rejoicing, all the different phases of life. I'm come to give you real life, abundant life that can't be taken away. There's a thinking that starts to develop when we think that God owes us happiness. If someone believed that God would want them to be happy, why would they ever sacrifice themselves for God's sake? If somebody believed that God's purpose was to make them happy, why would they ever deny themselves? Why would they ever choose God's ways over theirs? Why would they ever take up a cross and follow Jesus if we thought that happiness was our ultimate goal? You think that Jesus thought that the cross was his happy place? He prayed, God, I don't want to do this. But he knew what real life was. See, there's a form of idolatry that subtly develops in our lives when we seek after happiness for happiness' sake. We seek the things of this world that will make us happy. And there's a form of idolatry that says, God exists to serve me. And that's backwards, isn't it? We exist to serve him. And our highest goal should be to stand before him and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to say one of two things to us someday. He's going to say, well done. Or he's going to say, I don't know you. You've walked according to your own things, not mine. You haven't wanted to be in my presence. You haven't wanted to walk with, with my plans and my goals. So I, I don't even know you. You've done things on your own. Go off and continue to do things on your own. That would be a scary day. But when I think that God exists to lead, to, to serve me and my happiness, it leads to disappointment with God. You may have heard people say, hey, I tried the God thing. I tried the church thing, but it didn't work for me. <laughs> you know what they're saying? Yeah, I tried God, but it didn't make me happy. It's because they didn't understand who God was. They didn't understand the relationship between us and God and what God has done for us. What if we weren't seeking happiness? What if we were seeking a different destination in our lives? Would it change things? Instead of seeking happiness, what if we were actually seeking God and his presence? What if we woke up in the morning saying, this is not my day, this is God's day. I am his servant to be used for his glory. This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it as I give him the glory for it. As I live my life in a response in such a way that his name is honored. If I, I don't know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Does that sound familiar? If I seek him first instead of my pleasure. If I seek him first instead of my protection. If I seek him first instead of my happiness. What does God say will be added to me? Everything that I need. In the pursuit of God, the Spirit is released in our lives. It's John 4. Jesus is speaking to this woman, a Samaritan woman, that everybody else has rejected. 
And he tells her what's going on in her life, and she's amazed. And she kind of diverts the conversation about some spiritual doctrines, some church doctrines. And, and God says, Jesus says to her, listen, this water that you're dragging out of this well, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. That's God's promise for us. Life, real life. Paul said, said it this way. He said, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy. Let's say that word together. Joy, he wants us to be people of joy, but that doesn't always mean that we're living in a state of happiness. It means we're living in a state of understanding the relationship of what God has done to us and for us. And we pursue the kingdom of God, we get something better than happiness. We're given the joy that can never be taken away. Early Christians went through horrible, horrible times. But they were filled with a joy that was inexpressible. And the people around them saw the joy that these people lived with, even in the midst of hardship and trial. Trial's a weak word for what they went through. But the joy that showed out of their lives touched the lives of other people, and the church grew. People couldn't wait to be where God was. And that's what God says about us. He says, where I am, people will long to be. When you go through hardship, we don't blame God. We don't ask him why. We humble ourselves. We pray. We say, God, walk me through this. Help me to seek your kingdom and your righteousness and mold me and shape me as I am faithful to you. And we seek for his glory instead of our own happiness. See, happiness is not a what. Happiness is a who. When God allows me to be his child, when God honors me so much that he will live in me and through me, this God who created this universe, there is a joy there that Peter says is inexpressible. And it can never be taken away. And that will shine from our lives. Doesn't mean we put on a plastic face and pretend. It means we live the reality of the joy that can never be taken away. Whether times are good or whether times are bad. Let's pray. Father, we want to honor you because you deserve all the honor and praise. All the glory, Father, should go to you. It is not about us. It is all about you. And Father, there are times that we have sought our own happiness at the expense of your honor. There are times, Father, that we have despised your word and sought our own selfish ideals. And God, I pray, we are, we are living in a culture that is saturated with this idea of self and, and self-fulfillment and happiness. Father, protect us from the lies that surround us and help us to seek your kingdom first and your righteousness first. Help us to see what is true and what is real and what is lasting. And Father, may our rejoicing be in you. May we know the power of your spirit in our lives. Father, fill us with your spirit. Bless every faithful step we make and glorify your name through us. And cause us to rejoice in your presence. Cause us to rejoice in your spirit. Cause us to rejoice in the hope that you set before us that nobody can take away. It will never spoil or perish or fade. Father, you have promised it and you are faithful. God, help us to be faithful to you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
God is faithful to us and he is graceful to us and he has promised us great things. And when we say yes to him, he says yes to us. And he takes us through a journey. The journey has its ups, it has its downs. It has its blessings, it has its curses. But I'll tell you what, as Brian and I were backpacking that wilderness, it was fabulous, it was gorgeous, but I don't know, like someday I'm going to talk to God about mosquitoes. I don't know what he had in mind. Actually, I don't think God made mosquitoes. I think that's a, a gift of Satan for us. <laughs> but there were mosquitoes. We were going like this. I gained weight because I ate so many mosquitoes. But the last day we were there, the wind started blowing. And we were trying to hold everything down the, in our camp and light the fire and the stove and the wind was blowing things around. And, and you know what? <clears throat> we realized there are no mosquitoes. I said, if the wind had been blowing the first day, we would have complained about the wind. On the last day, we were saying, thank God for the wind. Because there are no mosquitoes. God works through all kinds of things. And we need to give him praise in all things. Andrew realized this week as God spoke to him that God is good and God can be trusted and put his life in God's hands. And we thank God for that. And you might sitting here, be sitting here wondering today, can I trust him? Can I put my life in his hands? God is faithful and he's good. If you've never put yourself in God's hands, we can help you do that today. To be baptized into Christ. To die to yourself. To be buried into him. As Paul says, and to be rise to walk a brand new life. Filled with his spirit. Cleansed of all the sin in your life. That's a wonderful thing. And God is, blessed. God is faithful to do that. But you might be sitting here struggling going, you know, I gave my life to Christ. But I've crawled off that altar too many times. I've taken my life back too many times. I need God's help. And our elders are standing right here in the back saying, let's sit down and pray about this. Let's go to God. He is our source. He is our strength. He is our hope. He is our joy. Let's go to him and find the strength. And if we can help you to walk that life that God has called us to, come here to be baptized. Go there to pray. And seek God. Let's do that while we stand and sing this song.